Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. Good evening everyone, we're going to be going over chapter 5 of Hebrews this evening, so looking forward to that and we'll be discussing some of the elements of Jesus as the eternal high priest which the Hebrew author goes over here. So let's go ahead and go to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of people in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided, for he himself is also clothed in weakness and because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sin for himself, as well as for the people. In this particular passage in Hebrews, one of the things that I really want to draw your attention to is he's making the argument here in the first verse, the high priest is always chosen from among men. Why? Ultimately, what is the high priest? He handles the rituals of Israel and the Yahweh cult. But it's more than that, isn't it? Because when he offers the main one that he is charged with and has the most important role in is the Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur. And this is where the high priest goes behind the veil. He enters the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant is. That is, according to the Old Testament, God's dwelling place. So he actually goes and he enters into the presence of God and offers sacrifices for sin. And that's going to be the primary focus of what the Hebrew author is talking about here. But it's important that it is a person. God doesn't have an angel or some kind of spiritual body come in and offer sacrifice for men. He has a person, a representative of mankind, to enter into the veil. And that's significant because he is a person that is offering sacrifices on behalf of all of Israel. So an Israelite is chosen, someone who represents the people. You can't be a representative of the people if you're not of the people. Typically, when we think of the word representative, what we think about would be somebody that is an elected official that is sent to represent some group of people. And that's a logical application of that concept. Well, would we elect somebody to go represent us as Alabamians just because that happens to be the state that we're in that was not of Alabama? No, that wouldn't make sense. He would not represent us because he's not from here. We couldn't just elect somebody from, you know, Minnesota or something and send them and say that they represent Alabama. Well, no, they don't because they're not from Alabama. They're not an Alabamian. You can remember in the last election that we had, Tommy Tuberville who is our current senator from the state of Alabama. He was somebody that was not born in Alabama, but he had lived here for over a decade. He had chosen to move here, and one of the biggest attacks against him was that he was not sufficiently Alabamian. He was not a native Alabamian. And so uh, this is a concept that our society even understands on the secular level. You cannot be a representative of a group of people if you are not of that group of people. And so the point that's being made here is fairly obvious. If you are going to have a high priest, it's something that is so elementary that people didn't even think about it, but it's a concept that's going to be significant here. If Jesus was going to be the Savior, he had to be human. If Jesus is going to be the high priest, if you were going to make God into a high priest to represent the people, he has to take on flesh. That's how it works. The Son of God, powerful and perfect as He is, is not an adequate representative of humankind if He's never been a human. And that's the point that He's trying to drive home here. In the same way that it wouldn't have made any sense for a Philistine to represent Israel before God as the high priest. In fact, it's extremely specific who gets to be high priest, and we'll talk more about that later. That It's not even just a Levite. Not only did you have to be a member of the correct tribe, you had to be a correct member of the correct tribe, and you had to be in the direct lineage of Aaron. And so, when it's talking about this idea of God having a representative come before him and represent the people, their interests, their sin, and offer atonement for them, it must be a human. 
And that's the reason that Jesus had to be a human. There were so many heresies in the first century, and some that were probably starting to crop up around the time of Hebrews, at least in its rudimentary stages. This idea that Jesus never really completely fully became human because the Platonic and and Greek philosophy and Roman philosophy, by extension, would have said that it's impossible for a wholly perfect being to become a human being because flesh is inherently sinful and flesh is something that inherently is bad. Well, that's not what the Hebrew author says here. He's like, not only is it okay that Jesus became flesh, he had to be a human to fulfill the task that God had set forth before him. And so this is the case that the Hebrew author is making, is that we needed a representative, and because of that, it, it had to be somebody that would represent on behalf of the people the things pertaining to God that would also be worthy. And so he had to be able to do this. And in verse 2 that you'll see there, he says that he can deal gently with the ignorant and the misguided. So it's interesting to note here the Greek word, and I know I'm going to butcher this, but just go with me here. Uh, Metriopathia is the word that is used here. And it's interesting if you understand the history of this particular Greek word. The Greeks had several different ways to describe grief. And this particular word is a form of dealing with grief that is the perfect median. So another way to understand this is it's directly between deep grief, debilitating grief, grief that would immobilize you. You know, people that go into mourning and they they just can't function anymore. Like they're so distraught over losing somebody or losing something that they just shut down and and can't do anything. It was the perfect midpoint between that and what's known as lazy indifference. So we have Jesus as the high priest being described as the perfect middle point between these two extremes. Philo, who is a Jewish scholar from the third century, he actually uses this same Greek word to describe Abraham's reaction to Sarah's death. And so he's saying it's it's clear from the scripture that Abraham mourned Sarah. He is sorrowful, but he is also able to get things done because he, he goes to where she is. He takes care of the burial. He buys the burial plot. And so he is mourning in an appropriate way. He's, he's not so debilitated that he is incapable of functioning and taking care of his family, but he is also not just indifferent. It's like, oh, my wife died. Okay. Like, it, it's the perfect middle point between those two things. And so he's saying here when he talks about Jesus dealing gently with the ignorant and misguided, he's saying that, because remember, we were just talking about how Christ is an empathetic high priest that has been tempted. So because of this, Jesus both sympathizes with us. He feels our pain. He understands what it's like to be tempted. So he doesn't have the indifference that's being talked about on the one side of that scale. But he also is not so uh, deep in the, the bowels of despair because of our sin that he is unable to take care of things and unable to facilitate his office as the high priest. And so this is something that a Jewish person would have been familiar with. That You would want a high priest that had this kind of quality. In other words, you wouldn't want a high priest that looks at sin and is just like, oh, that's human nature. That's the way it is. That's, that's the indifferent side of it. But you also don't want a high priest that is just so distraught at the sins of Israel that he is unable to fulfill the task that he is given as high priest to actually do what he's called to do. And so he's saying that Jesus is the perfect middle point, just like you would want ideally in a physical high priest here on earth. So uh, with all that in mind, I want to ask the question, what do we know about the high priests of Jesus era? So the, the Roman captivity, that period in Jewish history, what do we know about those high priests? Right, so it wasn't a, a lifelong office necessarily. They, they would serve for a particular period of time uh, and the, when, when they were appointed to the high priesthood. Right, so if you look through the historic record, there are high priests that come into power through different means, but one of the means that was the most common, especially in the time of Roman captivity, is that the Roman government basically would set up a puppet high priest. Because remember, at this point, Israel has no king. 
They have a puppet king that has been appointed again by Rome in Herod, but they have basically a pseudo king, and then they have a high priest who's also a very politically powerful figure, and so Rome would usually be involved in the process, even if they didn't necessarily pick him, they were certainly involved, in, and you couldn't become high priest without the rubber stamp of Rome in this particular era and time. So another good observation. Anything else? There probably were some people that were of the Levitical line. There's not really a lot of historic information on that, but uh, most of the Levitical tribe had been either wiped out or their lineage had been so diluted that they didn't know whether they were really Levites or not. So we, we get the indication, for example, from Paul. Paul knows he's a Benjamite. And so there is some, you could make the, the rationale that there might have been some of the Levites because the three tribes that were left over in Judah were Benjamin, Israel, and Judah. And there were some Levites still left over there because Levites were spread across the northern and southern kingdom. And so there might be some Levites, but we're not 100% sure about that. Right, no records were left after 70 AD when, when Rome sacked the temple at Jerusalem, all the ge genealogical records are lost. And so now they can't trace their lineage at all. But back then, in the time of Jesus, maybe they would have been able to trace it back to a Levite. However, whether they could or not, there is no question that the people that were holding this office were not Levites. And so maybe they had some Levite blood in their lineage, but they didn't know for sure. And so... Uh, one thing that you'll notice about all of the things that we said, and, and all of them were true, is that you've got Rome getting involved. You've got, we don't really know what the lineage is for sure. The, maybe there's some Levitical blood in like, you know, Caiaphas or Anaphas, uh, who are the high priests that we know recorded in the Gospels, but that's not a sure thing. And Really, it wasn't really considered, to be perfectly honest. They were just kind of appointed by Rome. And so the point in, in all of this is, all of these things that we just talked about, none of them are the way that Moses prescribed it. None of them. All of the qualifications for high priests, these guys have none of those things. And so it's interesting that we're at a point in Jewish history right now where the Hebrew author can, can reasonably say, you want to go back to the law of Moses? Really? They don't even have a high priest. We have a high priest now. We have a better high priest, and I get that they were probably doing the best they could in a bad situation, but you have, if you look at the history between the, uh, the Greek occupation and then Rome taking over Jerusalem, the high priest had really just become a political office. That's all it was. There were people that literally bought their way into the priesthood or fought their way into the priesthood by taking out the other high priests. Like, that's a thing that happened too. And so really this has become just a, a political figurehead and it is not the high priesthood that God envisioned or commanded in the law of Moses. And so that's something that they're dealing with right now. And I do find it really fascinating before we move on to the next passage that isn't it interesting that the whole theme of this book that we've been talking about from the very beginning, and it's true, is that this book is trying to make the case that Jesus is superior. He is superior to Moses. He is superior to Aaron. He is superior to the prophets. He is superior to the angels. That is the overarching theme of the book of Hebrews, and that is correct. However, isn't it interesting that it starts out this particular section by not emphasizing the, the royalty and the grandeur of the high priestly office? It starts out by talking about the humility of it. Because if you read through this, it's talking about the high priest is just somebody taken from men, and they are there to give sacrifices, and they are able to be humble and deal gently with, with normal people. And in the verse 3, now it's obviously talking about the earthly high priest. It's not talking about Jesus himself when it's, he's talking about these qualifications. Remember that all of the earthly high priest, they didn't just offer sacrifices for everybody else's sin, they had to offer sacrifice for their own sin too. And so what's happening here is the author is emphasizing the humility of the high priest office. Now he's going to talk about the grandeur in a second, and that's important too, but I find it fascinating that he starts out not by emphasizing that, but by emphasizing the lowliness of the office of high priest. And he's saying that Jesus interestingly enough, sort of paradoxically fulfills both roles at the same time. He is both humble enough to deal gently with people, but he is 
He has the majesty and the, the gravitas to fulfill the role of the high priestly office in a way no other high priest has done before because he is the sinless son of God. So we'll go ahead and read the uh, next few verses here. Well, if I'll... There it goes. Right. Verses 4 through 6. And no one takes the honor for himself, but receives it when he is called by God, just as Aaron also was. So too, Christ did not glorify himself in becoming high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have fathered you. Just as he also says in another passage, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, in verse 4 there, the word honor, that's a perfectly fine translation of that Greek word. However, it also gives the idea of an office or position. So when it says no one takes the honor for himself, you could just as easily translate that word. Nobody takes the office of high priest for himself, and that would be a perfectly acceptable way to translate that or, or position. That's another one. And this is something that comports with the Pentateuch. We know from Exodus 28.1, for example, that Aaron didn't say, okay, we need a high priest, I'll do it. That's not how it worked. God said, Aaron, you will be my high priest. This wasn't a question. It's kind of like how God called Moses, really. He's saying, Aaron, you're my guy. You're going to fulfill this office. Aaron didn't seek the office. It was, it was bestowed upon him. And so it's interesting that uh, Jesus is God's priest, and he is appointed as God's priest, which is not the way that it was for the priests in their day. We were just talking about this a few seconds ago. They either fought their way to the top, or they bought the office, or they got in good with Rome, and then Rome appointed them because they knew that they would be useful as a, a puppet political figure. But So every person that is living and reading this passage knows that the high priest that is sitting in that position right now in the temple of God, that's not really the high priest. That is not God's appointed high priest. And so the reason this is being emphasized in this passage is he's saying, but Jesus is the appointed high priest. And so if you're wanting to compare the two, you're wanting to fall back into Judaism and just go back to the law of Moses, there's no high priest there waiting for you. If you want to follow Moses, you have to have a high priest that is appointed the way that God intended it and the way that Moses said that it should be, and that person is Jesus Christ. So here's an interesting thought for you, and I, I thought of this when I was reading through this the other night. Isn't it interesting that in the Gospels, Jesus refers to himself by many different names. He calls himself the Son of Man. He calls himself the Son of God. He calls himself God it, God himself. He says that I, I am. That's from, from John. Uh, so he calls himself God. He calls himself a king. He calls himself a prophet. He never calls himself high priest. Not once. You will not find that anywhere in the Gospels. Why? It's an appropriate title. The author of Hebrews makes that pretty clear. Why would Jesus not call himself high priest? I think this is the reason. We have it laid out right here. Because Jesus could not seek the office of high priest because it was understood in the law of Moses. You don't seek that. You don't appoint yourself. That is something that God bestows upon you. Now, would it have been wrong for Jesus to call himself high priest? No, I don't think it would have been because it only reflected reality in the same way that it was not wrong for him to call himself God, because he actually was God. I don't think that would have been a wrong thing, but I think it's fascinating that this little tidbit is brought up, that the high priest is never somebody that seeks out that office, it's somebody that God appoints specifically, and that's, the, that's one of the few titles that we see used in the epistles that, is never, uh, that Jesus never bestows upon himself. And so... It's as though he is appealing to the Father's authority by saying that uh, Jesus is the appointed priest, not the priest that, that claimed it for himself, like the priest of their day. And this is also important, too, to remember that the rebellion of Korah, which happens in Numbers 16, we, we know what happened there, right? This was a man who did seek the office of high priest, and he says, no, I don't, I don't think Aaron's a good choice for the high priest. I'll be the high priest from now on, and God was not real happy with that. God swallowed up a whole bunch of people. They lost a significant portion of their camp because of that rebellion. And so 
that's a very real world of example of how God feels about trying to appoint yourself the high priest. And so to close out this particular passage, you'll notice that there's two citations from the Psalms here. The first one is Psalms 2, which we've already read Psalms 2 a couple weeks ago. This is one of the royal Psalms that was typically, at least they believe it was sung or recited at coronations of the kings of Israel. But the second one here is a new one where it talks about being the priest in the order of Melchizedek. So let's go ahead and read Psalm 110. And again, remember when a biblical author of the New Testament cites a specific portion of the psalm. He is invoking the totality of the psalm. And so that citation means I'm, I'm calling upon the ideas that are contained within the, the entirety of the psalm. So let's go ahead and read Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now remember, before we go any further, Jesus also asserts that this psalm is about him. That takes place in Matthew twenty-two forty-four, When he's arguing with the Pharisees, he says that this is a messianic psalm. And so uh, it's interesting there that he cites that, because if you'll remember that story, they were debating about what Messiah will look like. And Jesus' response to them is, So, tell me. Who is the Messiah? Whose son is he going to be? And they said, well, that's obvious. It's, it's David. And Jesus said, very good. You can, uh, you, you can take your A on your theology exam and you can go home now. That's not what happened. What he said was, and I do think that the Messiah is David's son. They were correct in that, but not in the way that they thought about it. And Jesus corrects them there. He says, so tell me. If the Messiah is supposed to be David's son, how is it in this psalm, the psalm that we're reading right now, Psalm 110, he says to him, the Lord of my Lord. Now, if this is not a messianic psalm, or if the Pharisees didn't think of it as a messianic psalm, what's the obvious rebuttal? Well, that's not what David's talking about in that psalm anyway. But they didn't do that. Why was that not their rebuttal? Exactly, they knew it. They knew that that was a messianic psalm. They considered it and had been teaching to their people, this psalm is about the Messiah. And so I want you to keep that in mind as we're reading through this, that the Jews of his day, the Jews that the Hebrew author is writing to, and even the people that opposed Jesus looked at this psalm and said, that psalm is about the Messiah. This is a prophetic psalm about what the Messiah will be like. So let's continue. The Lord will stretch out your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely on the day of your power. In holy splendor, from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. So, if you've studied the Psalms, you know that this is not a terribly uncommon thing for you to occasionally run across what's known as a royal psalm. And these were also known by another name, the Messianic Psalms. And so even Jewish scholars to this day acknowledge that these psalms are about the Messiah. Even though they don't believe Jesus was him, they look at these psalms and say, that's about the Messiah. And so isn't it interesting that in this royal psalm, which is specifically supposed to be about a Messiah, about an earthly king, it talks about the Messiah being a priest in the order of Melchizedek, which is what the Hebrew author just cited. A king that's a priest? That's not something that the New Testament ever allows. You may recall that in Kings, Uzziah was actually specifically punished by God for trying to be both priest and king. He tried to offer sacrifice and God struck him with leprosy because that was not his role. You don't have a priest king. That's just not a thing. God was very specific about this. You can't be both priest and king. That's inappropriate. So why is there a psalm declaring that the new and rightful king of Israel will also be a priest? That doesn't work unless you're talking about Jesus. 
this idea that he is going to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And isn't it also significant that he talks about it being a priest in the order of Melchizedek? What do we know about Melchizedek? Not, not a lot. He kind of comes in and comes out pretty quickly, but, but we do know something. So what, what do we know about him? Right, so far as we know, Melchizedek has no connection in blood to any other priesthood. It, he was just He was a priest kind of on his own. And not only does he not have a tie to the Levitical line of Moses and Aaron, he's not even a Hebrew. He's a Gentile. And so it's interesting that he is a priest despite having absolutely no blood connection to any of the Levitical priesthood. And remember that Genesis was written by Moses, who is the same guy that said to be a priest, you got to be in the tribe of Levi. Even he acknowledges that Melchizedek is a priest of God. What else do we know? Anything else? He's right. Y'all were saying the same thing. He's the king of Salem. He's a warrior king priest. That's the only time that that ever happens in the Bible because every other king was forbidden from being a priest. And so it's just remarkable to me that this idea of the Messiah as both king and high priest, it only finds fulfillment in Jesus Christ. There's some things in the Old Testament that make sense by themselves but they make more sense once you get the New Testament. Like you can look back having the, the hindsight of the New Testament and say, oh, that, that makes more sense now. This makes no sense without Jesus. This, this psalm does not make sense unless you have Jesus Christ. Somebody who is both a warrior king and a priest. Because Melchizedek is the only other character in the Bible that fits that description. And so he's a priest after that lineage. So let's go ahead and look at this passage from Genesis 14, 17 through 20, which is the, the story. These are the only verses we have that talk about Melchizedek at all, other than the psalm and that we just read. Then after his return from the defeat of Shelomander, Shelomander, I have no idea, uh, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, now he was a priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has handed over your enemies to you. And he gave him a tenth of everything. So this is really all we know about Melchizedek from the Old Testament, other than the psalm that we just read. We know that he helps Abram save Lot. We know that he's the priest and king before Israel had either of those two things. And so, remember we were talking about the diatribe earlier in our study that basically uh, the Hebrew author will on occasion head off an argument before it starts by presenting an argument beforehand. He foresees that one of the obvious rebuttals to his theme of Jesus as high priest is going to be, whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus can't be high priest. He's not even a Levite. Well, the, the answer is, oh, well, the guy who gave you that command, Moses, acknowledges that Melchizedek is a priest. He says that in the writing. So there can be priests of God that are not Levites. And this to me is, I mean, it just blew my mind the first time that I read this. He, he's greater than Abraham, and he's, he's going to bring that up later in Hebrews as well. But this just absolutely blew my mind. What does Melchizedek bring? Bread and wine. That's a pretty obvious tie-in to the Lord's Supper, isn't it? You will have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And that is symbolized again in the Last Supper. I mean, that just threw me for a loop. If that's not obvious providence working in God's Word, I don't know what is. That... We're talking 2,000 years before Jesus is born. And this seemingly unimportant detail is just happens to be included in the story. That's not a mistake, y'all. That was intentional. And so I, I just, it, that just gave me chills when I read it for the first time that, that it actually talks about him being the bringer of bread and wine and how he fits the description of Jesus and foreshadows that as well. And to, to Brother Bob's point that he was just talking about Abram pays him tribute, which in this context, that means that Abram is acknowledging 
that Melchizedek is a priest and he is of greater importance than him, which is the reason that he is willing to pay him tribute. And he gives him a tenth, which is also interesting because that's how much you were supposed to tithe God, which we find later in the Pentateuch. And so he's treating this warrior king priest as though he's God, which is exactly the role that Jesus Christ fills. And so the parallels between this character and Jesus are just like, it's almost every single detail that we know about him somehow ties into Jesus in some way. So let's go ahead and look at the next passage, uh, verses 7 through 10. In the days of his humanity, he offered up both prayers and pleas with a loud crying and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. He was heard because of his devout behavior. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him, being designated by God as the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So we started out this chapter emphasizing Jesus' humanity, and this is a continuing theme throughout this chapter. He talks about the days of his humanity, obviously talking about when Jesus was here in the flesh with us. He offered up both prayers and pleas with a loud crying and tears. Personally, I think, I can't think of an exception to this rule. Every time I see Jesus praying in the New Testament, that passage emphasizes Jesus' humanity. And I think that that makes sense when you really think about it, because if Jesus is the eternal Son of God, which of course He is, then the time where He's with the Father, He doesn't really have to pray per se, because He's just in communion with Him. But when He becomes a human, He prays just like we pray, because that's how we talk to God. And so this is just another way of emphasizing Jesus' humanity by talking about His prayer, talking about His sorrow, the laments that He had, when that was taking place. But it's interesting to me that it talks about that, and then it goes into this thing where it's talking about Jesus learning obedience and being perfected. Now that's interesting, because how can the perfect Son of God who has no sin and has never been disobedient learn obedience? If He is sinless, how can He be perfected? Right, so that, that's what the verse is saying here, isn't it? That through that suffering, he has learned obedience. How would that teach him obedience? Yeah, so I'll start with the last first. We are talking about perfection. The Greek word for perfection is teleos. And the idea behind that is when something is perfected, it is brought to fulfillment. So for example the Greek word that is used when Jesus is on the cross where he says, it is finished. The Greek word there is teleos. And so he's saying it is perfected. It is brought to fulfillment. It is the, the thing that which it was set out to do, it has fulfilled its nature. That's sort of the Greek philosophy explanation of this word. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right there that where it talks about him becoming perfected, it's not that Jesus was imperfect or that he had sin. It was that he rose to the station and fulfillment for which he was sent. His mission was completed. And so the fact that that same word is used when he dies on the cross, that's the last words he says up on the cross, I think that that's significant is that it's tying it back to that. So th that is him reaching his fulfillment. But what you were saying about obedience, I, I think is also very profound. The idea that you have to endure suffering to learn obedience, there's something very human about this. Obedience is practice. You know, it's one thing to never disobey, because sometimes you cannot disobey, and that's what you were going to do anyway. Like, you know, when I was a little kid, if my dad had told me um, after I'd been working in the yard or something, all right, son, go in, take a rest, you've earned it. Well, you didn't have to tell me twice. Like, I was ready to head in anyway. And so I was being obedient but I wasn't really learning a lesson from that because that's what I wanted to do regardless. When Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, which I think that this is talking about, he had to learn obedience. He had to do something he didn't want to do. And that's made very clear by the scripture that this was something he did not want to happen. And so in the same way that we have to learn obedience, now he did it while being sinless, but 
there's a similarity between the way that we learn obedience and the way that he learned obedience in the garden. And I think that that's part of this idea that, that the author is trying to emphasize that Jesus can relate to us because he's been through those trials in the same way that we have. And I think that this is really interesting because it's talking about that perfection happening. And then again, he brings up the idea of being a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. What does it mean to be in the order of? Well, it's just like an order of knights. It's a group of people, a lineage. And so if he's in the same order of Melchizedek, then that must mean he became a priest the same way Melchizedek did. So here's the million dollar question. How did Melchizedek become a priest? He's appointed by God. That's right. Now, we don't know what that process looked like. We don't really have any information other than those few verses that I read you. But the point is, God had set forth a criteria of some sort. Melchizedek met it, and he was appointed the priest. But he is not a priest after the flesh. He's not a priest because of Aaron. He's not a priest because of his lineage. He's not a priest because of his ties back to Abraham. He is a priest solely by faith and obedience. That's it. He is a spiritual priest. He became so not through his lineage and not through the law, which is the same way that Jesus became a priest. Because by the law, Jesus is not a priest. But by the Spirit and by appointment of God, he absolutely is a priest, and not just a priest, the great high priest, the one that is above all other high priests. And so when it says he's in the order of Melchizedek, what it is saying is the Aaronic order of priests, that is done away with. And it is inferior to Jesus Christ's priesthood. The order of flesh, you know, which coincides with what we read in John 4, right? That there is going to be a time that comes when the true worshipers will not worship in this place or that place, but in spirit and in truth. That's exactly what Jesus foretold in John 4. We're moving past this idea of the fleshly priesthood and into the era of spiritual priesthood. And so Jesus is a spiritual priest in the same way that Melchizedek was. So let's go ahead and, and read the last few verses here. Concerning him, we have much to say, and it is difficult to explain since you have become poor listeners. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the actual words of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unacquainted with the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who, because of practice, have their senses trained to distinguish between good and evil. So a little bit of background into the, the word study here. The word righteousness literally means right teaching. That is the, the Greek word that is used here. That, that's the definition of it. And sort of the idea that the author is trying to drive home here is that it's not even so much that the milk is bad. It's not a bad thing to need milk. You know, when a baby drinks milk, we don't think any less of them. They're a baby. That's all they can handle. What he is saying here is, you guys should be teaching other people this stuff by this point. But we keep having to go back to the basics. In fact, the Greek word used here to talk about the, the basic principles, that actually means like your ABCs, the, the absolute fundamentals is the idea that is given here. Um, it's okay, for example, for a four-year-old not to be able to read. We understand that, you know, it takes a little time. Not okay for a teenager not to be able to read. And that's the idea that Paul is trying, or I say Paul, the Hebrew author, it was totally Paul, but the Hebrew author, he's trying to convey to them that they have become poor listeners in the sense that they keep trying to go back to the basics and he's trying to teach them these more advanced things, but he keeps having to go back over the elementary principles over and over again, even though they should be moving past that at this point. And so if you look at verse 14, I think that it really gives this away where he talks about uh, someone that is mature is able to distinguish between good and evil. So why do you not put things like, say, cleaning chemicals around a baby? Because a baby can't distinguish between food and things that he doesn't need to eat. Like to him, milk and poison, well, I'll just put it in my mouth and see what happens. Like that, that's how they think, and that's why you have to be careful with what you put in front of a baby. 
If you give a baby something bad to eat or you give them spoiled milk or something like that, whose fault is that? It's not the baby's fault. It's your fault because you're supposed to know better. And that's what Paul is trying to get across to his listeners here is he's saying that you should be old enough to be able to discern between good doctrine and bad doctrine by this point. You should have the spiritual maturity to look at a teaching and say, that's false teaching. I'm not going to listen to that. You know, from time to time, luckily nobody here, but I have caught in flack from fellow members of the church for reading authors that are not Church of Christ members. And sometimes reading material that has things that I disagree with and I think that are not good. But the point that I always try to emphasize them is you should be mature enough to tell the difference. I'm not scared that I'm going to read something that is just bad theology and I'm going to be taken in by it. Now, you know, I'm not perfect either, and so occasionally that could happen, and that's part of the accountability that we, that we have with our brothers and sisters in Christ. But the point is, that's the kind of maturity that Paul is looking for here. And it's the maturity that unfortunately he has deemed that they do not have. And so, sort of the practical application of this to us today is I think we need to ask ourselves, if we're constantly longing after the basics, if we're just wanting to be taught things like the plan of salvation and how we worship, and we we want that to just basically be on repeat in every lesson that we hear, again, I don't think there's anything wrong with those things. I obviously agree that those are important subjects to cover. But I think if that's all we ever want to hear, or we're terrified that we might hear an, an idea that is from outside the church because we could be taken in, I think we need to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, are we spiritually as mature as we need to be? Because it seems to be what what the author is talking about here is he's saying to them, you guys should be past this at this point. In fact, you should be able to discern good from evil and be able to tell other people, maybe that are newer in the faith or maybe that are legitimately infants and really don't know the scripture and, and legitimately do need that milk at this point. You should be able to help them discern between that but we keep having to go back to the basics and it's, it's unfruitful and it's not good for you and it's not good for the church. And so I challenge you to think about that as we go throughout the week is, is really ask yourself and try to take an honest look because I think we could all stand to be more spiritually mature, myself included. But really try to take an evaluation of that and, and how confident you are in that because you may be at a point where you do need to brush up on the fundamentals so that you can get to those more advanced steps. And you may be somebody that is at the advanced stage that looks at that and goes, I need to be able to teach this to other people. And so regardless of where you are, I just ask you to think about that a little bit as we go through this week. We'll, we'll pick up on chapter six when, uh, on the next week. If you're watching this because you liked this video, awesome. Be sure to like and subscribe and click that little notification bell. If you're a leftist that's only here to hate watch, hang on before you punch that dislike button. You see... I identify as a Hispanic woman, so if you dislike this video, that's literally violence against me and you are now guilty of a hate crime. Why do you hate beautiful trans people of color like me? What you gonna do now, Woke Brigade?